Hello everybody and welcome to this episode of Object Oriented Programming. In this episode we're going to look at modules and packages and understand how Python allows you to structure big systems. So up till now we've created standalone applications. We've written a program in a file that has a class and methods inside it. But as we build up more and more classes and more and more methods and attributes, we need a way to organize it. How Python organizes things is every file that has Python code in it is called a module. And when we put a, a couple of different files, like notepad files, imagine notepad files in a directory, the directory is a package. And that means we can, if I have two files in the same directory or folder, I can call one file from the other. This is phenomenal. <laughs> this is amazing. Like This is so much better than a lot of other objects or programming languages where you have to install class pads and, and change system variables and all kinds of crazy stuff. If I have a Python program and another Python program in the same folder, they can just talk to each other by calling the name of one into the other. That is great. It is ruinous to you, I think, in a way, because this is so easy compared to some other object-oriented programming languages. Anyway, we'll have to live with it, we'll cope with it. So when I use the term module, what I'm talking about is a, a Python file, a .py file. And when I say a package, it's a folder with a bunch of .py files in it. So the benefits are obvious. Let's say I'm building an e-commerce system. And um, I have a single file that contains all the classes related to accessing a backend database, we'll say, that's, that's storing all the e-commerce transactions. And then I have other modules about products, about customers, about inventory, and things like that. They're all in the same folder. E each of them just needs to make a call to the database file, and that they don't have to make connections to the database themselves. It's just a single connection from the database file to the database. So this is a very effective and centralized way of dealing with connections and, and, and separation of, of authority and activities. So if I have a file or a module called point.docstrings.py, if I want to call that file, or rather if I want to call the methods or attributes or the class from that file into another file, all I just say is import point doc strings. That's it. If the file is called banana and the class inside is called point, to import the point class, I need to say import banana. So I'm importing the name of the file. Okay? That's what the import means. It's look for a file with that name, point doc strings. .py somewhere in this same folder. And then once I've imported it, all I, if I want to declare an instance of point, I just say point strings dot point and, and assign it to a, a variable name. So this is important to remember. What you're importing is the name of the file, not the name of the class. The class inside can be called, again, if the file name is called banana and the class inside is called point, I import banana, and then I can do banana.point. So if we look at it in code, simple as that, we, we say import doc strings, and then we, we can declare variables of type doc strings. We can put values into the points as before. We can print them out, and that works perfectly well. So if you want to have a go with that now, take the point strings code that we have, all doc strings that we have done since for the previous lesson, and just create a new file calling doc point doc strings and have a run of this. In fact, the sample code on this page to, to do that, just to see that in action. Just to, uh, to use a, a specific term, now that we've included point doc strings into the calling program, we said that point doc strings is part of the, that calling program's namespace. The namespace is the list of methods and classes and attributes that are available to a current program. So if I'm the calling program, if I say import banana, then banana is part of my namespace now. So whatever I have in my own code, all the methods and attributes classes I have in my file, plus any I import, they're all part of the, my runtime namespace. If we, 
if we didn't want to import the whole file, because when we say import doc, point doc strings, it's importing all the classes, all the methods, all the attributes. If we just want to import a specific class, and we've seen this before, we can just say from doc strings import the class point, and then we declare a point as before. And as code, that looks exactly as before from point doc strings import point. So when we're saying that, all we're saying is from a file or module is the Python term, import a class. And then we can use the class to declare instances or create objects of that class. If by some unusual circumstance we already have a class called point in the calling program, let's say the calling program has a, a class called point in it, and I want to import a different point, but its name is point as well, we can import it as pt, for example. So the class name we're importing is point, but it's coming in as, it's being renamed as pt because there's already a, a, a class called point in our namespace already. So then we go p1 equals pt. So let's look at our code. It's simply that from point doc strings import point, but import it as pt. And then we declare instances of pt which are the point method from doc strings. We could also import more than one class simply by saying from point doc strings import point, comma line, comma square, comma banana, whatever we want. We did use it a little bit in the last term, but we, we probably should avoid saying import star or from doc strings import star. A lot of Python programmers get very angry and confused when you do that because they don't know what specific methods you want from the point doc strings uh, file or module. So it's as well just to specify which particular classes, in this case point and line, that you want from the particular module. Now let's look at how we organize the modules. So how do we organize the files within our folders? Because, you know, you, it would be nice to have all your Python programs in a single directory or folder, but it just gets confusing, so we need to start putting things in subfolders. We said a folder or subfolder is called a package, so we'll use the term package and folder or directory interchangeably, and we'll use the word module or Python file interchangeably as well. So let's say we have a folder called parent directory, and in that it's got a Python program called main. It's also got a folder in it called drawing, and in that folder it's got three files, rinit.py, point call, and point doc strings, and a folder as well called maths, and inside the maths folder it's got rinit.py and the theorem.py as well. In Python, when you're creating packages or subfolders, you always put an rinit.py file in each subfolder. We'll talk about that in a second. Yeah, absolutely. So the ini.py lets you do stuff. There they are. In, in, so this is it. Uh, same thing again. We've got drawing and main in the top directory. And then in parent directory drawing, we've got two regular Python programs and then init and then a subfolder called maths. And in the maths one, we have theorem and an init file. For the moment, let's leave the ini t double underscores empty and let's look at how we bring in packages. We've looked at one way which we'd call an absolute import and we look at a relative import. Absolute imports are how we've been doing them up till now. Um, so it's, it's, what it means is we specify exactly where we're getting a file from. If we, we can say import a particular class by saying import drawing dot point call or from import from drawing dot point call import point, or from drawing import point call. We'll remember that drawing is the name of the folder, and then one of the files in that folder is point call. So the folder is drawing. That's the package, and point call is a file in that folder called a module, and we can import classes from each file. Hey just like that. So drawing is the package or folder, point call is the module or file, and then point is a class that we're importing from 
a specific file in a specific folder. That's an absolute, that, that assumes that the file I've written the code in is in a folder, that drawing is one of the subfolders directly underneath it. We can say, we can mess that around a bit by using relative naming. So what relative naming means is if I put in a dot in front of a, a package name, I'm saying it's in the current directory. If I put in dot dot, it means it's in the previous directory. Putting in a dot doesn't really matter, but anyway, we'll see it. So if we have our file structure again, and I, I'm in the file point call, and I'm talking to the file point doc strings, then all I need to do, I can say from either dot point doc strings, or I don't need to put the dot in. I can put it in or not, it doesn't matter, because they're in the same folder. Whereas if I'm in the folder mats, and in, in the folder mats, I have a method called theorem, or a, a file called theorem, and I want theorem to call the file point doc strings, which is one directory up, then I need to say from dot dot, which means go one folder up from where I am, look for a file called point doc strings dot py, and then import point from there. So I hope that's clear. There is one thing we can use init.py for. We said leave it blank for the moment. But if I'm in a particular folder and I want to ask, well, if I want to ask for a specific class from a particular module, I can use init.py to do it. So if we're, let's say, we, we want to get the point class from the file or, or module called point strings, point doc strings. For, if we're in the main directory, we say import drawing dot point doc strings dot point. We could add the following phrase into init.py though, which is from point strings import point. And that means I can say from the main directory, import drawing dot point, instead of having to say import drawing dot point doc strings dot point. So if it says it in the initialization file, we're going to be looking at the doc strings file all the time here, and the point class is the one we'll be importing. Then I just need to say, in the drawing folder, get me the point, and the init file tells us it's in point doc strings. And then, yeah, if all we, ha all we have to say is just from drawing import point, which means in the, from the folder, give me the class point. We don't need to specify a module because the init file tells us. So it's kind of like that file converts the drawing package into a module or the folder into a file. That's kind of what it's like. So moving on now, let's look at organizing module contents and more specifically, creating global objects. So inside of a module, we can specify variables or attributes, classes or methods. As well as creating global classes, we can also create a global object though, which I want to look at in this example. So if we think about our e-commerce site again, it connects to a database where we're saying, so good practice would say there should be one database class and all the other classes connect to the database via the database class. Not only should there be one class, but there should be one object. Because we can't have different classes being instantiated, different database objects. So we need a, a single database object. Let's look at the case where there's multiple objects. If we have a module called database, and we have some implementation, and then in our database code, we say database one is assigned an instance of database. That means we've created an object of type database, and we've given that instance object a name database1. Now that is a problem. So then in each of our other uh, modules, in our product mo uh, module, in our inventory module, in our customer module, we'd have code saying from e-commerce.database import database1. The problem there is that then we're going to end up with multiple instantiations, multiple copies of database1. 
which is definitely a problem because then each one will try and connect to the database separately and it'll cause a bit of a delay. So we'd prefer not to have these multiple connections that'll slow down the process. Instead, what we can do is rewrite as follows. We have our class implementation of database as before, but then we say database one, the variable is assigned none. So it's got no value at the moment. It's not instantiated to anything. And then we have a new method called initialize database. And the initialize database then creates database one as being database. So when I call now the database class, that's not going to create an instance of database. It's only when I call initialize database that the instance database one will have a value. And when I say will have a value, I mean it will be connecting to the, the system. So now what that means is because of where we've placed database, the declaration in our code, everybody can ac access database one, but it won't be created until we initialize it. There's another way we can do it, which is slightly interesting, I think. There is a variable in Python called main, uh, and main means, well, what main means, that variable means is that I'm calling Python code from the command line prompt. Particularly, what I mean to say is there is a variable in Python called name, and the name variable is set to main when I'm calling a, a particular bit of code from the prompt. So let's say the file is called banana.py. If at the command prompt I type banana.py and I run that code, then the variable name is set to main. Whereas if I call the same code from an, another method, let's say fish. If I call from fish, then the variable name is going to be assigned to be fish. So what we can do here with our code is our useful class is only called, or rather the database is only initialized in this case when the program is being called from, from the command prompt, from the main. Because as you can see there, the module main instantiates the database one to being of database type. So if I'm not being called from, a, from the command line, it's not going to create an instance of database for me. But if I am being called from the command line, this is really excellent and a really interesting way of instantiating a database connection. So in other words, we're only going to have one instance of database. Uh, one other comment I think that's worth making. Until now, we've kind of assumed that methods and attributes are within a class, but we can also have a class within a method. Here's an example as follows. If we look at this code, it's called format string, and this is a method format string, and it takes in two parameters. It takes in a string and how we're going to format it. So our formatting could be to change the font, to make it bigger, to make it smaller, to capitalize all the letters, to just capitalize the first letter, to put everything in lowercase, to make it italics, to make it bold. So we, we take in two commands, a message, something like hello world, and then what formatting do we want on it? As we can see, we've, we've defaulted the formatter to none. That is to say, there's no formatting specified. If, if, there, if this program is called, so if I say format string, inverted commas, banana, inverted commas, close bracket, with no formatter, then the formatter will be assigned to none. If it is assigned to none, then we need a default formatter. So our default formatter in this case is a class. And that class default formatter has one method inside. And the method is called format. And all it does is takes in a string and returns that string in title case. So that's dot title, open bracket, close bracket, which means capitalize the first letter of each word. All right, so what have we got? We've got a method called format string. It takes in two parameters the string, hello world, and how we want to format it. And then we've got a class inside called default formatter, which will just, the default formatter simply sets it to title case. Now, our second bit of the code is, it just says that if there is no formatter coming in, if, it, if, if I don't specify how to format the code, create an instance of formatter using the class default formatter which we know will just title case everything, and then return that string capitalized with each letter. 
So if I call this program as follows, if I say, hello string, it's hello world, how are you today? And then I print out my input string, and then I print out my output string by saying format the string. I'm only passing in one parameter, which is hello world, how are you today? Which is hello string. I don't say what formatter I'm sending in. So we know if there's no formatter, it creates a class called default called formatter of, uh, of type default formatter. And lo and behold, the default formatter will set the first letter of each word to caps. So for example, the input will come out as hello world, how are you today? And then the output will simply be the same string but capitalized. Because we didn't specify a formatter, it just capitalized the first letter. If we had put in, uh, if we had said format string, hello, hello string, comma, bold, the text will come out as bold. If we said format string, hello string, string, comma, italics, it will come out as italics. Because we haven't specified what comes after the hello string, we just title case it. And that's a, a text explanation of that. So that's exactly it. It's, it, it's defaulted to title case. So that was modules and packages. Thanks very much. We'll see you in the next episode.